um, my topic today is speaking revolution. And basically, I want to run it as sort of like a workshop, um, or at least a lecture, on how to talk to people about revolution. And some key things to keep in mind. I'm going to go over the two main forms of speaking about revolution uh, that you can do, and uh, will probably have to do, and sort of the form that those should take, and some key points that you should keep in mind when you're engaged in it. So before I get into the details of that, uh, a couple things. First off, if you have any questions, comments, criticisms, uh, please mention them, or feel free to raise your hand and interrupt, because I'm sure other people have those same questions. Um, also, before we talk about speaking revolution, we need to talk about a couple things that need to happen even before you talk to people about revolution. Um, you need to have three core beliefs. If you don't have these three core beliefs, um, whatever tactics you try, you will fail. And you will always fail. And the three conditions you have to believe is you have to believe that you're dealing with an ethical subject. Now, if you believe people are so brainwashed that they don't really make any choices, you don't believe in an ethical subject. If you believe that people's religious background and upbringing determines who they are, you don't believe in an ethical subject. If you believe that people's beliefs are too strong and they will never ever change, you don't believe in an ethical subject. You have to believe that you are dealing with a person that can make real decisions, that can make real choices, and that can really consider what it is that you're saying. If you don't believe that, you're wasting your time. Um, maybe you're making yourself feel good about yourself, but if you don't believe they can actually make a choice, then nothing you say really matters. In addition, when we're talking about revolution, even if you believe in absolute pacifism, we're talking about something very dangerous. We're talking about something that requires a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money, um, you know, a lot of sacrifice. And ultimately, and it may lead actually to the ultimate sacrifice. Even if you're a pacifist, um, capitalists have shown time and time again, the US government, the French government, the British government, the Japanese government, um, all sorts of Latin American governments, that even if you're peaceful, at the end of the day, if you're enough of a threat, if you can make a real change, they will kill you. They will disappear you and torture you and leave your body in the countryside somewhere. And that's not even talking about violent revolution. That's not talking about arms or war or guerrilla you know, actions. That's just peaceful people have been brutalized by this system. So if you're not dealing with an ethical, uh, an ethical subject, why would they sacrifice their life? There's a certain point where self-interest just doesn't make it. Right? You can sell people self-interest that maybe they could have more schools or more police officers or more trains if they stop you know, invading Iraq. But when you're talking about organizing events, you know, putting the time and effort to fight against you know, the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war, repression of, or FBI repression, immigrant repression, that's going to take sacrifice. And if they don't have any ethical reason to be or doing that, then you really can't expect them to ever do it. And so if you don't believe that you're dealing with someone who can make ethical decisions, then you're just wasting your time. The second thing is you need to believe in the possibility of revolution. You have to believe that you can actually create a revolution, that it can actually happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that you yourself will do it, or you'll be the next Lenin or Mao or Clara Zetkin or you know, Emma Goldman or Rosa Luxemburg, but if you don't believe that this capitalist system can be overthrown, then you will never reach anyone when you're talking about revolution. I spent a lot of time on an effort on this left communist who, um, basically this left communist was uh, you know, always filled and plagued with doubts. You know, the people were so stupid, the media was so powerful, how could we ever really change anything? And then when we, when we look at revolutions, nothing really changed. It was the old boss, the same as the new boss. And he never had any success converting anyone to revolution. He never inspired anyone to take action or organize. And I told him this, and I'll tell you this, and I think this is accurate. Working class people, because he was an academic, he was a student, he went to school, uh, he would read, you know, Marcuse, Adorno, um, that, that and their ilk. And I said to him, 
they may not be able, working class people may not be able to uncover every single one of your mistakes or your fallacies or point out your, the flaws in your arguments, the flaws of your evidence, because you're an academic. But they know bullshit when they hear it. And if you don't believe in revolution, why should they make the sacrifice and the commitment that is more, more than you as an academic, as an ivory tower paper revolutionary, why should they make that commitment to risk themselves, risk their family, risk their livelihood, and risk their lives? And so it's absolutely vital when talking to people about revolution that you believe a revolution is possible. If you don't, you will never get anywhere. Because like I said, they may not know why you're wrong, but they'll know bullshit when they hear it. And then the final thing is you have to believe that there is some way to reach people. You have to believe that there is some method by which you can tell people about revolution. You can reach them with arguments, with um, reasoning, with rationality, with evidence. If you don't believe people can be reached, then again, you're just wasting your time. And that's more than just that they're an ethical subject, that they can make decisions, right? You have to believe that you, yourself, can actually reach them. If you feel, oh, I don't know enough about revolution, so I can't talk about it. If you feel, oh, I'm too shy, I can't talk about it. If you feel, oh, you know, I'm really uncomfortable in crowds among other people, then you won't reach anyone. And you need to be able to believe. And it's a process. You will talk to more people about revolution than you will get interested in revolution. But in each instance, as we get into the discussion of the structures and the methods, in each structure, you'll be able to see more and more how it plays itself out, how to deal with it, how to address it, how to talk to people, how to keep your cool, what ways to approach certain questions, what ways to avoid approaching other questions. And essentially, if you don't do that, if you don't believe that you can reach people, if you don't try to reach people, you will never learn, you will never grow, and you will never fix your mistakes. And so it's absolutely vital that you believe that there's a method to reach other people. So you need to believe in the ethical subject of the person you're talking to, that they can make real decisions. You have to believe in the possibility of revolution, and you have to believe that there are actual methods of reaching people. So what are these methods? There are two main um, ways in which you're going to end up talking about revolution. Is that spelled right? And Jake, are both of these getting on camera? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. So there are two different methods. One is analytical. You'll primarily use this when you're talking to individuals. The other is rhetorical. This is what you'll use primarily when you're talking to groups and when you're debating people. Now, here's an important distinction. We get in debates and arguments with people all the time. Um, if, you, if there are only two people, you should never be using the rhetorical style. If it's you and someone else, if you're using a rhetorical style, then odds are you're probably failing. When you're talking to individuals, it's important to use the analytic style. And I'll get into more on what this is. But rhetorical style is for an audience. And the way in which you talk in front of an audience is going to be different from the way that you talk individually, one-on-one. -on -one. So this is going to be the primary mode of interaction that revolutionaries are going to have to deal with. You can give the most rousing speech in the world, but odds are it's going to be your personal connections, your personal ongoing discussions with your friends, with your family, with people that you just barely meet about revolution that are going to get people interested and studying and working for revolution. So I'm going to spend most of my time on this, but I will also address the rhetorical. So what we need to do is first, we need to understand the sort of basic structures that are at play. And I would highly recommend that everyone read um, Sigmund Freud, Jacques Lacan. Um, if you want to find out psychologically, in a psychoanalytic sense, how human structures and how linguistic structures function, these are the two best people to talk to. They will give you the best insight 
in why people say the things they do and under what mechanisms they come to say them. Um, if you're looking for Sigmund Freud, um, I, I would recommend picking up the Gay copy. Uh, Peter Gay has a collected works. Um, so just make sure uh, he's the best translator. That would be great to go through. Not all of it is going to be pertinent, um, but a lot of it will be, and it will give you a good foundation. And then Jacques Lacan's Écrites, uh, which is his writings, it's incredibly difficult. And you will have a hard time going through it. But if you manage to get through it, you will have a very powerful tool in which to analyze uh, or psychoanalyze more appropriately, um, your interactions with other individuals. So again, just be aware of that. So let's just touch very briefly on basic psychoanalytic theory. Now I want to be clear, what I'm giving you here is an activist tool. I'm not giving you the full details, I'm not giving you the background. Um, to put it a different way, uh, you can have a driver's license and know how to drive a car without knowing how the car is made. So that's what I want to give you. I want to give you the tools that you can use with a basic understanding of the system so that you can use those tools effectively to understand what's going on. So there are four basic principles that underscore psychoanalytic theory and psychoanalytic discourse. So the first is that humans are linguistic animals. We are animals, but we also have language. And so, so that's the first point, is we do have an animality, but the language is what is decisive about human beings. The second thing is humans have drives, not instincts. Now, the difference between a drive and an instinct is this. An instinct is a life-preserving, uh, homeostatic, um, impulse. So if you're hungry, you eat. Um, if, for example, dogs. If dogs are ovulating, how's it going, man? Um, if dogs are, uh, you've come in at a great moment. If, if dogs are ovulating, they go into heat, the dogs have sex, and then it's satisfied. What you'll notice is that is based on just life functions. Here's what's different about drives. And so once an instinct is satisfied, it's satisfied. Once the dog has enough to eat, the dog is by and large done eating. Um, once the animal has you know, copulated while in heat, it's done, right? Until it has puppies and starts the process over again. Instincts are discrete. Drives, however, are not. They're a black hole. They're a black hole around which our impulses circulate. Think about food. Think about Americans. Think about how fat Americans are. Now, this is not just a point to jab Americans, but human beings don't function like animals in this respect with instincts. Instead, we are filled with drives. We can always eat more because we don't eat for life. We eat for pleasure. Now, we do need to eat to live but we have pleasure linked to our natural life functions. Why do people have sex when they don't want to have kids? Again, pleasure linked to the life function. So much so that the life function becomes secondary. You can eat yourself to death. You can have sex to the point that it's unhealthy and damaging to you. You can drink too many intoxicants. You can read too many books. You can sit and watch too much TV. Because for drives, the decisive thing is pleasure or enjoyment, not the satisfying of life desires. So this is um, the second important point to keep in mind when we're dealing with individuals. Humans run on drives, not on instincts. So the third thing is that the socialization of individuals is a trauma. Going back to drives, we all want to eat the best food all the time. We all want to have the best sex all the time. We all want to get everything that we want all the time. When we're angry, we want to hurt, we want to kill, we want to destroy. Um, when we feel lust, we want to possess, we want to dominate. 
but then society steps in and prevents that. It prevents us from exercising our drives. Now, I don't mean this in a moralistic way. I'm not saying necessarily that giving into one's drives or socializing one's drives is either good or bad. What I'm saying is that's the situation we're dealt with. Human society stunts, directs, controls our drives. And as human creatures governed by drives and governed by languages, we are constantly trying to find ways to cope with these drives and the trauma of socialization. The final thing that we have to keep in mind, and this is where we start getting into how to talk about revolution, is this socialization creates structure. How our drives are directed, how our drives are stopped, how we gain pleasure, how we feel pain, all of those are structures created by the very process of socialization. And the main mode of socialization is language, speaking. When you speak to people about revolution, you are touching into some of the most core human structures that exist. One, because you are bringing to the fore, right, a sort of anti-socialization. We are talking about removing some of the key structures that human beings today exist and base their very lives on. The market system, profit, a waged job, hierarchy, arbitrary hierarchy, forms of power, forms of violence. When you talk about revolution, you are advocating for an entire new set of structures. So I cannot stress this enough. You are tapping in to some very primordial aspects, which is why you'll notice talking about the Utah Jazz, talking about video games, even talking about music does not get people as angry and as impassioned as talking about revolution. Because again, you need to keep in mind these structures. You are dealing with something very primordial. So, here's sort of the question. What are the structures that are at play then that we are going to be addressing, that we are going to be seeing every time we mention revolution? There are three main structures um, and again, this is not a scholarly class on psychoanalysis. I'm trying to give you the basic tools to begin understanding what it is that's going on when you start talking to people. The first and most important structure is going to be desire. The second structure is going to be law. And the third is going to be the subject. So, let's go back. One of our axioms is that humans have drives, right? And these drives are focused in certain ways, in social ways. This is the desire. The desire does not usually appear. I want a cookie. I want a girlfriend. I want a new car or a job that doesn't suck which I don't actually I don't have. But that's neither here nor, here nor there. Usually, these are only surface icons or surface manifestations of something deeper. I just want small government. I just want, you know, I just, I just want a good politician elected. I just want somebody honest in Washington. You know, I just want capitalism because it lets me take care of myself and my family. All of these are surface. They don't hit to the root of the desire. Now, let's go back for a moment. Desire is, or uh, socialization is traumatic, which means our drives, which are socialized into desire, are also going to be traumatic, which means they're also going to be covered. So you will never, ever, ever run into anyone who will tell you 
the desire, clearly. Or if they tell you, or let me put it a different way, they will only tell you about their desire, but they'll never know they're doing it. So let me give you a good example. I talk to people all the time about revolution, and in our particular area, they're extraordinarily libertarian, right? And so you, well, we'll get into the discourse of how to do that, but you push them and push them and push them, and you know, I just want small government, I just, you know, I don't like communism, et cetera, et cetera. But then you'll, you'll notice that there's a cycle of terms that keep repeating. I just don't want anyone to tell me what to do. Under communism, people tell you what to do. You know, I don't, you know, I don't want anyone telling me what to do with my family. I don't like the idea of government telling me what to do. And you'll notice when you start talking to people, they'll start doing these cycles. And they won't be talking to you. Usually when people start saying this stuff, it has nothing to do with anything I'm saying. Because I, I have a body of knowledge that I work from. I'll talk about Cuba death statistics or infant mortality rate. But then suddenly over and over and over again, I just don't want anyone to tell me what to do. I don't want the government telling me what to do. And we'll address how to, how to deal with this. But the point here is they're telling me what they desire. They're not giving a political argument. They're not really looking at capitalism, because as I'm sure all of us know, the corporations donate the money and get with that or whatever the hell they want anyway and tell everyone what to do anyway. right? So it's not about what's really going on. It's not about the surface. It's not that they're a Tea Party or a Libertarian or a Republican. What it is is they have this desire for freedom. They have this desire. And also, again, desires are socialized. Desires are repressed. Which means, usually when they have this desire, it's because it's what they're lacking. Usually it's because what is happening in their life is they are not free. I just want to take care of my family. You know, I don't, I don't want to have to worry about what goes on during a revolution because it's too dangerous. What are they really looking for? Security. Security that is not present in their life. When you analyze the desire, you'll begin to see how it plays out. So, what is the desire? Well, that's where all the impulses reside, as we talked about uh, before. How it's structured is it's structured as an immediate impulse. So what this means is it's not, it's not complex. It's a base, or not even necessarily base, but it's a primary impulse. So Freud famously, or uh, I think it was Freud and Lacan, uh, famously said there is no negation in the unconscious. And the idea of this is, you know, when you say, like, I don't want X, Y, and Z, the way you're thinking about it, you still have to, in your unconscious, posit it. Which means to say, oh, I, I don't want to be here giving the lecture. But to ve the very act of framing it in that way has to affirm in my head, in my unconscious, I want to be here giving the lecture. Now this may sound weird and complicated, but you'll notice that when people speak clearly, they usually phrase them, or when it's not complicated for them, when it's not wrapped up in all sorts of psychic desires, they usually posit it in a pos or they usually say it in a positive way. I want communism. I'm a communist. Now, this is the RSU, and we're an anti-capitalist organization, so of course that's problematic. But this is the thing: is most of us here don't frame our political beliefs as a negative. But yet, what you'll notice is so many working class people you run into do. And the reason that they do is because it's tied up with all of this sort of psychic tension. I'm not, I never hear this. I never hear, I want to be a good Mormon. Mormonism being the main religion here. I always hear, I don't want to be a bad Mormon. How many of you have that experience? That, that usually they, they frame it as a negative, right? But that's the thing. What's going on there? What's going on there is that they don't believe that they could ever be a good Mormon. What they feel is that they're failing at being a Mormon. And that's what's really being expressed, is their failure as a Mormon. So watch. Watch for negation. Watch for the circles that people go around, where they're no longer listening to you or talking to you, but instead 
what they're speaking about is their desire. And again, this desire is going to be throughout the entirety of the individual. It's going to structure all aspects of them. So let's talk for a second about bad Mormons. Well, why would anyone feel like they're a bad Mormon, right? Because we're, we're creatures of desire, right? We have impulse. I mean, if you want to be a Mormon, then you should just take it with both hands and just feel good about it and do it. Well, the problem is socialization. This is where the law comes in. For every individual, there is usually a law um, which can pass by the term of the superego. And it can, it's sometimes called the conscience, but it doesn't function like any conscience. The law is there to make us guilty. And you'll notice this, that when people talk, there's a certain structure by which they're not good enough. And this comes from society. It's a product of socialization. And why it comes about is because, look, if all of us just gave into our desires, right, it would be chaos, right? We would, not anarchy, but it would be chaos. If everyone did whatever they wanted at any time, in any way, in any shape or form, without any socialization, without any concern for other individuals, without any concern for the collective, how long do you think it would take before, at best, we were living in some sort of Mad Max world, if not living in a world of, like, Ayn Rand land? Well, not even Ayn Rand land, but, like, cannibal zombies, right? Because it wouldn't even just be, like, I want more. It's, like, anyone who bothers you, you kill them, or you hurt them, or you torture them, right? Like, who here has had somebody really annoying, and they've been really pissing you off, and you feel like, I just want to smash you in the face as hard as I can, because I hate you so much. But you don't. Who has ever had that experience? Ever? I mean, I don't know if we want to admit to that. Oh, okay, but this is the point. There's something that stops you. Now, you can just say, oh, well, it's because you'll get thrown in jail. But why do you care, right? Animals get hunted down all the time, right? And, and what do they do? They, they gnaw off their own legs. They'll snap. They'll bite. They'll do things psychotic, well, not even psychotically, but just instinctually to get whatever they, they, their instincts tell them and to avoid any pain. And yet human beings don't behave in this sort of way. By and large, our society is not based on the physically strongest dominating the rest, because we have a process of socialization, of law, that structures our desires. And it's important to note that these are connected. Every law that someone has, it denies the impulse, but it also creates guilt and pleasure in the guilt. So, for example, why feel guilty about anything? Really, I mean, if you screw up, I mean, you hear this all the time, oh, just let it go. Don't be so hard on yourself. And yet almost no one does that. You should question why. Maybe it's because the law, the thing that makes them feel guilty, also generates this sort of pleasure. Because keep in mind, what is the very basis of the law? It's to socialize us. It's to keep us from our drives. It's to keep us from our desires. So if you're violating the law, what are you doing, right? You're enjoying your desire. So here's sort of the thing about this. When you notice the law, you'll notice it functions in weird ways when you're talking to people. And this manifests itself as a non sequitur demand, a law that just has to be followed. We cannot get rid of capitalism because if not, people would just, people would just all be the same. We couldn't have that, just people all being the same. Well, why not? There's nothing in principle wrong with people all being the same. There's a law functioning in the background, in their socialization, that says people can't be the same. It has nothing to do with reality, but it has everything to do with the law that they have that is structuring their desire. They need to compete. That's where they get their pleasure is from that law that says everybody has to be different. There has to be better and there has to be worse. 
But the thing is, that's not everybody's law. Everyone is socialized somewhat different. I've heard everything on why we can't have a revolution from everyone will be the same to there needs to be rich people and poor people so we know who worked hard. Yeah, I didn't say it was good. I just said it's what I've heard. <laughs> Two, we can't have a revolution because it will be too violent and destabilize our society. Right? That's not a moral, that's not really necessarily all that much of a moral claim. That's not claiming there's anything great about our society. It's just claiming that destabilization is the worst thing. Now, in each instance, there's a different law functioning. And when you're talking to people, watch. Watch their desires. What is circulating in the background? And then what is the logic of that? Now, I'm not saying it's reasonable, right? That at no one, we can't have equality. Or, um, I'm sure anarchists get this a lot of time, without the state, everyone will go crazy. Well, what are they really saying? They're saying without the state, they would go crazy and do whatever they wanted. So, again, here's the thing, as you'll notice, Desire circles around and gets its logic from the law. Now, again, be very careful when we talk about logic. Oftentimes, schizophrenic people have their own sort of logic that makes sense. Like, I, I worked at a gas station, and some guy came in and wrote jawbone, and then get each one of the words, the things, and it was like, Jesus against white Nephites or something weird, and he's like, it proves that there's going to be an earthquake that destroys Utah. <laughs> now, my point isn't that anything matters about that guy. The point is that a logic doesn't necessarily have to be rational or reasonable, and it's your job, and it, it very rarely is. So when you're talking to people, keep your eyes open for that law that is structuring the desire. Now, you'll notice both of these things by and large, are in the background, right? They're things you have to look for. They're things that aren't obvious. They're patterns, they're associations, they're connections that you will always be trying to find. The third thing is the product of these first two things, and that is the subject. The subject is the conscious individual who reasons, who feels, who thinks, who makes decisions. What you'll notice is desire, because it is an immediate demand for the impulse, don't think, just act, feel pleasure. And the law, because it structures, don't consider, don't reason, feel guilty, obey. Both of these are the enemy of the subject. And it is the subject, going back to our original points, that we need to look for. We need to look to that aspect of humanity that is not simply governed by desire, by violent impulse. And also we need to go and, uh, and search for the part of humanity that is not simply falling in line to obey. We need the part of humanity that thinks, that reasons, and can make decisions. And that's the subject. So what is the subject? Well, um, first off, it's the site of ethics, and also it's the component of all of the things in the background but also the history, memories, knowledge, <coughs> excuse me, experiences. These are the sorts of things we need to address. Thinking, rationality, these are the things that we need to approach. And when we're talking to people, we need to always treat them as a subject. So there's a very dialectical aspect. The first part of the dialectic is the background. All of us, every single one of us, is conditioned by both our desire and the laws that structure it. And this is not under our control, in a certain sense. But then all of us, presumably all of you listening to me, are thinking about this, relating it to your previous experiences, relating it to your memory, to your history, to your friends, your family, your emotions, 
And you're doing all of this consciously, right, in the foreground, as you as a person. And that is the subject. So the subject arises from the structure of the desire and law, but also the subject can break the cycle of desire and law and make ethical decisions. The Catholic, the Catholic nun or Catholic deacon who reports a pedophile priest, uh, a child in an abusive family that stands up to that abusive parent, the white middle class college student that sits at a Warworth's counter with black protesters during segregation, the Argentinian doctor who has everything waiting for him back in Argentina and makes the decision to throw it all away to pursue revolution. All of these are subjects. All of them have broken with the coarse desire. I could have a comfortable life. I could have an easy life. I could have a middle class life, a white life, whatever. And the law, fall in line, obey, blacks are different. You are of a higher class. You have an education. You have such a bright future. They break with both to become subjects that make decisions and to embrace that. That is what we need to push. That is what we need to guide people towards. So we need to show them, first off, that their desires do not rule them, that they can make decisions, and that even though humans are animals, that there is a subject that can choose, however difficult it may be, and if we're talking about revolution, it's incredibly difficult, but can choose to do that. And we need to get them to understand that there is no law. Now that is not to say that people should give in to their every single desire. What it is to say is that that impulse that all of us have that says obey, obey your religion, obey your parents, obey your father's expectations, obey your mother's trauma and neurosis, uh, obey the state, obey capitalism. You are an American, you must support it. All of that does not exist. It is a construct. It is something that arises from socialization that as conscious individuals we can overcome. And we need them to overcome the laws that have been socialized into them by capitalism. Laws of racism, laws of sexism, laws of classism, laws of oppression, and get them to fight back. Yes. So at a point that I feel like for some people, it's like literally to them like life or death, especially religious people, discussing this idea of law, why do, like Mormons, um, in whatever way they're like into this thing now supporting like capitalism even though historically it wasn't that way, but now it is. And to these people, I mean for them it's like in a way literally life or death. If they don't follow these laws, like it is not this life, it is their whole eternity that they'll have to pay for it. So how can you even begin to I don't know, speak logically to people who, I mean, to them, that is the logic. So that's a really good question, and that brings us right into the next part, which are the discourses. You don't speak the logic of reason, necessarily. You don't speak the logic of the classroom, and you don't speak the logic of the formal proof. What you need to do is speak the logic of desire. You know Will Van Wagner, right? What religion is Will Van Wagman? Mormon. And what does Will Van Wagman do? What are his political beliefs? I mean, they're in a gray area, but yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you can take a shot. Yeah, he's like an anarchist. He's like an anarchist. And what sort of work does he do? I don't actually know what he does. So he's he head of United for Social Justice. Oh, I thought you meant work as in. Oh, not his job. <laughs> like, what sort of revolutionary fidelity investments? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what sort of revolutionary work does he do? A lot. A lot. It's socialism. Socialism, right? Can you think off the top of your head, in a substantive way, of anyone who does more revolutionary work 
than will. And that's sort of the thing. He's Mormon, and he's really Mormon. Um, do any of you here, I, I probably shouldn't say their names online, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, do any of you know Michael Law? He started, I mean, he was more liberal than some, but we were in Utah County. But he was a conservative Republican Mormon. And now when I talk to him, the law that's been replaced, which is not necessarily optimal, but he actually, because I, I wanted a paper from him, and I was like, hey, you know, I, we need to talk. And he was like, he, he called me later and he said, yeah, I thought you were going to, I thought you were going to call me out on being such a wishy-washy communist. And so you'll notice what he felt guilty about was not that he was betraying the church. What he felt guilty about was that he wasn't being communist enough. Right? And this is possible everywhere. But we have to know how to address it. All of these Mormon people, and not just Mormon people, all of these people, whether they're religious or not, have desires and have a law that they're following. And what atheists usually fail to do is they fail to understand the logic of those laws and they dismiss it. They dismiss it as stupidity, they dismiss it as fanaticism, and they dismiss it as dogma. But, because I was raised in Utah, I'm much more comfortable dealing with the interactions of religious people and addressing them through the analytic form than I am asshole atheists. I would always take a conservative working class Mormon over an Ayn Rand loving upper class atheist. And the reason why is because the logics are familiar to me. And this is why it's so important to speak revolution. Because you will not know how to do it. It's a process. It's a materialist process. I can't give you a blueprint and you say, oh, there it is. It's always interaction and every individual is different and every law even ones that seem very similar have variations and gradations that you have to address. And if you feel like you're not getting anywhere, then what's probably happening is you're addressing the law wrong. You're, you're approaching it wrong. But that's not a full answer. What we need to do is we need to talk about the discourses. That should just be discourse, there's no plural. So, here are our four discourses. There are four non-revolutionary discourses, and there's one revolutionary discourse. The first and most common discourse of which all other discourses are based is the master discourse. What is the master discourse? It's because I said so. That is the basis of the master discourse, and you'll run into this all the time. Now, what does that look like in, con in concretely? The parent says, why do I have to go to bed? Because I'm the parent. Because you are the child. There is no rationality. There is no consistency. It is simply because I say so. Why do I have to clean out the fridge uh, in the walk-in cooler when I just cleaned it out yesterday? Because I'm your boss, and I told you to do it. Again, master discourse. No rationality, no consistency, simply the raw exercise of power and authority. Because I said so. It's also an appeal to authority. Why can't gays get married? Because the Bible says so. Now, this is a little bit of a, a, a gray area, and we'll get into this with the university discourse. But it becomes the master discourse when you are the authority to speak on the Bible. I am a Baptist minister, and I know the Bible back and forth, um, and you need to listen to me. Or the Pope. I speak to God. That's why you need to listen to me. Or a position. How many of you heard... Well, I don't necessarily, you may not like Bush, but you have to respect the office. That is an appeal to the master discourse, that the signifier of the president is something that you must obey, whether you like it or not. Now, what you'll notice is a lot of people talk in this discourse. If you talk in the master discourse, you will never get anywhere. At absolute best, if you are amazing at speaking in the master discourse, you might find cultists to follow you. 
and you can make it something leftist or pseudo-leftist, but that's what you've got. Uh, not to be overly sectarian, I don't know about the internal workings of it, um, but I would look to the RCP as I understand them. So again, I'm more than receptive to people from the Revolutionary Communist Party correcting me, but what is right politically? What Bob Abakian says, why? Because he's the leadership we need. That is pure master discourse. There is no reason to believe that. And I'm, I'm singling out the, the RCP now, but you'll notice people do that all the time. Why, why can't you put up X, Y, and Z? Because it's my committee. Master discourse. Because I said so. Not appropriate for a revolutionary, that is. University discourse. This functions in because I know so, right? And what does it look like it, at its basis? It looks like overwhelming people with information. Have you ever had a discussion with someone online and they post a wall of text? And it's usually all shit, but it's like 10 pages of weird minutia. This isn't a, a minutia is fine details, um, you know, just, you know, miscellaneous information. I, all the time with the Federal Reserve, when you talk to conspiracy theorists about the Federal Reserve, what do they do? They throw dates at you, they throw times at you, they throw names at you, they throw different organizations that are connected and governing each other. And what do you, the, the very fundamental basis of the university discourse is one, to make knowledge now, this doesn't have to be real knowledge or scientific knowledge, but knowledge in the discourse as the basis. But also, ultimately, it serves the master discourse, right? Because there's all this knowledge, all this knowledge. Well, why is the knowledge itself important? Because someone says so, right? You can have all these facts about, Alex, or, uh, about the Federal Reserve, but ultimately, why do you believe the Federal Reserve uh, is some evil, nefarious New World Order organization? Because of Alex Jones. I heard it from Alex Jones. Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck is a good example of all of the bad sort of discourses. Because he, he throws, right, all the information. And isn't it interesting if you look at the second executive of ABC who went to a party in 1986 with Jimmy Carter, who is connected to the Tides Foundation, and therefore, Barack Obama is a Muslim socialist, right? University discourse, and then, but what is it always serving? Because I said so. Because Bush is the president. Because of real America, right? So these two are closely connected. How does this look like when revolutionaries use it? Well, uh, it usually looks like jargon or special knowledge. If you are talking to people about how the day that the international proletariat as a multinational vanguard party of the working class will rise up in resistance to late capitalist global imperialism of the bourgeoisie and its comprador classes, both in the racist heterosexist oppression of both uh, you know, people of color and the proletariat, both nationally and internationally, you are engaged in the university discourse. Interestingly enough, the other name for the university discourse is the pervert discourse. Why? Because you over-identify with the law. It becomes a sadomasochistic experience of enjoyment, which there are people you will run into who love the university discourse. Not just using it, but being a part of it, right? How many people have you run into that don't know what the hell they're talking about, but they drop reference after reference, book after book, et cetera, et cetera. And what you'll notice is it doesn't convince anyone who isn't part of this. Academia is the basis of the university discourse. It's not a coincidence. What do academics do? They sit around discussing obscure passages of Benjamin. Why? Because it's the minutia. It's an attempt to lend consistency to the master discourse. It's an attempt to legitimate through tireless working of knowledge 
of an internalized university discourse. When we do that, all we come across as are pretentious, out of touch assholes. You can say workers instead of proletariat. You can say bosses and investors and bankers instead of the bourgeoisie. And you can say people around the world instead of the international working class. You can talk about a party that responds to people's uh, desires or responds to people's um, votes, but also is well organized and can fight for the people. Just as easily as you can say Vanguard. You can say workers' councils as easily as you can say Soviet. You can say uh, a commission as easily as you can say Troika. Um, and you can say, you know, take your pick. When we engage in this sort of behavior, we lose. Because the only people who it attracts are perverts. People who want to over identify with power and knowledge. Now, I'm not saying that they don't have their uses. As Lenin said, sometimes a scoundrel is useful because he's a scoundrel. But if we're talking about working class people, they don't want that. They don't want endless jargon. And neither do we feel like we have to inculcate them in endless jargon. And this is also difficult. You can quote Marx and Lenin and Mao and Luxembourg and Goldman and Berkman if it's salient to your point, if they're talking about the issue at hand and it's relevant, but if you find yourself thinking because Marx said it, because Goodman said it, because Kropotkin said it, you are engaged in university discourse. You need to approach every individual new with fresh eyes and not treat anyone you're talking to as though there is some secret Masonic ritual of speech that you can use to turn them into a revolutionary. Because that's ultimately what become, the university discourse becomes. The next is the hysterical discourse. And its big function is, what do you want from me? So here are some uh, forms of hysteria. Hysterical victimization. Um, in everyday life, why are you treating me like this? Why are you acting like this? Why do you hate America? Hysterical demands. Why don't you love me? Why won't you talk to me? Why won't you think of the children? Why won't you think of the community? How does the hysterical discourse operates, it operates as an appeal to the law. It's a trauma brought about to the law that asks the law to justify itself. Now, here's the thing about the hysterical discourse, which is good. If you run into people who are hysterical, you can help them often guide them through the question of the law. But you should not be acting in the hysterical discourse. You can give arguments against the NATO intervention in Libya. What you can't say is, why don't you care about Libyan children? Don't you care that they're being bombed? That's hysterical. That is a hysterical appeal to their law. Why don't you have the same law I have? Why isn't the law making you feel guilty? You're not going to guilt anyone in the revolution. But conversely, what if someone is hysterical to you? Now, it depends on the ways. What is going on with America? Like, there must be some secret society or new world order that's controlling things. Because every what's going on like in our country? Everything's going crazy. It looks like our country is going to collapse. They're asking for an answer from the law. Now, you can give them an answer, and they may interpret that as the law, but by answering them, by giving them a consistency, this is what's going on. This is why this is happening. It's not immigrants that's destroying the economy. It's not foreigners. It's the wars. It's the bankers. Suddenly, you can start giving consistency to their hysterical demands and move them from hysteria 
to a normalized discourse, right? To a discourse in which things are consistent or they recognize the inconsistency of the main discourse. They recognize, wait, hold on a sec. We're being told that we have to cut our belts back, but then we have money going to bankers and money going to the war and money going to corporations. Wait, this entire discourse isn't consistent. And by recognizing the inconsistency of the discourse, which is a fancy way of saying recognizing that the people or the things that the politicians and bankers are telling us are lies and are self-serving and don't match the truth, right? So you notice how I moved it from university discourse to a regular discourse? They begin to recognize that the law itself is not there. How many of you have heard in this debate, you have to balance your budget. Why doesn't the government have to balance the budget? Right? We've all heard that. It's a law. It's a law about balanced budgets. You get people thinking about society. You get them thinking, wait, but the government is not like a person. Like a government can spend money on teachers and roads and trains, and that creates jobs, which creates people buying things, which creates taxes, which actually helps pay for it. So that's one way, just on its face, to address the law. Wait. Hold on, this isn't a law because the government isn't a person. It doesn't function like a person. Alternatively, and this is not necessarily an approach, and maybe it works for some people, is why does anyone have to balance their, their budgets? There's enough money to go around. There's enough food to go around. Why, do we, why does anyone have to balance their budgets? Because it's all a bunch of pieces of paper. Right? What you'll notice is both of those answers critique capitalism, but also show the radical inconsistency of the law. It addresses and attacks the law. Now, I'm not saying, oh, well, I've got to copy that down next time someone says, oh, well, why don't we have to balance the budget? Because it's about interaction. It's about approaching every individual as a new sort of discussion and conversation. Which brings us to the final discourse, the revolutionary discourse, the discourse that we need to adopt, which is the analyst discourse. Now the analyst discourse, it asks, what do you want? Why is that? In concrete, it manifests itself as, what's wrong with, uh, what's wrong with communism? What is it that you like about capitalism? Now what you'll notice is these, co these questions are not demands or secret demands. Why won't you think of the children, right? That is a, is a secret demand. It's a demand to the law that you feel guilty. Well, what do you want? Now, what do you want from me is different from what do you want, right? There's no presupposition that what you want is anything from me. And so the entire point of this is to ask questions that get people talking. So let's look back at these structures. Well, we say there's a de desire. We say that there's a law. Now. One of the thesis of psychoanalysis is that every conversation is a conversation directed to someone, right? And we've talked about this a little before, is people direct it towards the law. They direct it towards that thing that they feel they have to satisfy. What happens if you're quiet or only ask questions, neutral questions that don't presuppose things? Who do, who do they start talking to then? Try this. If you don't think this is how it works, try it. Find somebody you know really well. Don't look angry. Don't look sad. Don't look tired. Give them no more than three word responses for five minutes. And you will see them create a story about why you're not talking to them and what's wrong with you. Have any of you done this? Try it if you haven't. Now, besides being uh, an incredibly unpleasant experience for the person you're doing it to, what it does for you is it shows you what it is they think is going on. Suddenly, their conversation is not directed to you as an individual. It's between you and the law. What they imagine, what they desire, what is structuring how they think. And by having this, you can begin to analyze their desires. This is where the old axiom that organizers 
should listen more than they talk comes in concretely. This is the structural reason. Not just because people will magically tell you what it is that you, you want. I don't know, I don't, or what they want. Um, I don't buy the Saul Alinsky, let's survey everyone method. Plenty of people, working class people, want really shitty things. If we were to walk around and ask people what do they, what do they want with immigration, we're in Utah County. They want deportation. They want Arizona-style legislation. That doesn't give us any information and it doesn't give us anything to order, organize around. It doesn't give us any revolutionary avenue. What that does, if we think that's what organizing is, all we do is become servants of the master discourse. You hear this all the time. We've got to do what the community wants. There is no community. Or if there is a community, there are multiple communities. There's the uh, white uh, Mormon community. There's the white non-Mormon community. There's the rich community, the poor community, the Latino community, the Asian community, the Latino worker community, the Latino business community, the Latino Democrats, the Latino Republicans, the Latino Mormons, the Latino non-Mormons, the Latino Catholics, the Latino in-betweens. There is no community. And this sort of like, oh, I just have to hear what people think. Terrible. Terrible way of organizing. And you just end up reproducing whatever it is that was their basic ideological outlook to begin with. What you need to do is you need to then address the subject, the individual, the thinking, choosing individual. And you do that through the analyst discourse. Most of you have tabled with me or been around me when I table. I give the RSU spiel, because that's the RSU spiel, and we're a non-tenancy organization. And not that I don't enjoy giving an RSU spiel, but I have to, because my positions are not the RSU's positions. But then we start talking, and, I, and then I, immediately after I have to say, you know, there's a lot of different views. I myself am a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, you know, a communist. And how many times have they said, wait, you like Mao? And I go, well, what's wrong with Mao? You like communism? Well, what's wrong with communism? And then you get all sorts of varied responses. Oh, there was no freedom. Oh, you know, uh, they put everybody in jails. Oh, Mao killed the dinosaurs. You know, you get all sorts of weird answers. But by asking that, rather than just launching into how great Mao was or how great communism was, it opens up so I can begin seeing what is really going on in the background there. And then I can begin addressing specific issues if their issue is about freedom and people telling them what to do, the cultural revolution. If they are worried about security, what do I talk about? I talk about infant mortality rates and life expectancies and education and equality. If they're afraid of being dominated, what do I talk about? I talk about the corporations. I talk about the Supreme Court ruling that says corporations can donate as much money as they want. Strategic intervention. And so I make that intervention and then I let them talk again. What is it they're thinking about? When you run into the Mormon person that's like, I just need to be a good Mormon, well, what if, or, you know, you're like, oh, well, I'm atheist, or I'm gay, or, you know, I don't believe in Mormonism. How can you not believe in Mormonism? Well, how, how could I not believe in Mormonism? How could I not be gay? How could I not be atheist? How could I not be a communist? And then it becomes, and then they'll start unfolding every single thing, or not every single thing, but they'll start unloading that you can begin seeing that structure behind. You can see what's really going on, which they're telling you. It's not that they're not saying it, but it's not consciously being said, right? And that's how you can start approaching them. You need to become an expert of the logic of the law and the logic of desire. And only once you begin to analyze those can you really address the subject. So that's the basis of the analytic approach. That's what we need to use when we're approaching individuals. Any, did that answer any questions? Have any additional questions? Anyone? Yes, no, maybe so. Shake your head now if you have no questions. No? Okay. All right. 
Was there anything that was unclear? Or you felt needed another example? Okay. Well, I guess not. Let's go to our second form, which I need to hurry. And Jacob, do you still have the thinking revolution? Or has that been handed over? No, that wasn't handed over to me. Oh, okay. Well, probably in like eight to nine months, uh, you can look at the first lecture in the series, which is thinking revolution. Um, and what it is, is it covers the way to do critical thought, which will address most of the points of logos, um, which we'll talk about here in a second. So uh, feel free to look up that lecture. Um, it's like I said, uh, online someday. Um, so let's talk about rhetoric and the rhetorical uh, style. The analytic style is for when you are one-on-one. -on -one. And when you're get building revolutionaries, being one-on-one -on -one is the way to do it. But sometimes you'll be in public. Now public can mean two people instead of just you and someone, so total three. That you're talking to two people instead of one. In which case you need to be conscious of what's going on. When you're having a debate, a public debate, you need to be conscious of what's going on and you're gonna change your style to a rhetorical style. So the basis of the rhetorical style is essentially public speaking. You need to keep in mind your format. This is foremost. You need, uh, there's about four components. One is you need to keep in mind the opponent, the person that is challenging you, the person that you need to address and deal with. The second is you need to keep in mind the audience. Who's listening? What are they looking for? What do you want from the audience and what does the audience want from you? And you need to look at the conditions of the audience. Essentially, this kind of goes back to what do they want and there's gonna be all sorts of different aspects and nuance of that. We'll get more into that later. And then we need to look at the time for discussion. It's very easy if you're in a formal debate, but by and large, you won't be in a formal debate. You'll be at a party. You'll be at a class, you'll be in a hallway, you'll be at a table, you'll be at work, and by and large, it'll be an informal debate. This does not mean you don't have to worry about time. You do, this doesn't mean, obviously, that you need a stopwatch and you'll go five minutes and then stopwatch it for them going five minutes. But you need to be very conscious on how you use your time. Always give them time to speak. If you are the only one speaking, you don't come across as wise, you don't come across as learned, you come across as an asshole. Now, it's a little different if nobody's saying anything. If you talk for a little bit, and then you say, well, what do you guys think about that? And they go, well, I don't know. It's interesting, I have to think about it. Then you can go on, right? But if they are giving objections, then you wanna give them time to speak, because then it doesn't look like you're monopolizing the time. But also, you don't wanna to speak too little. If somebody is going on and on and on and on, there's a certain point in a conversation where you can't, it's very difficult to go back to points before. And it's a skill to keep all those points in mind so that you can go back to them, so that you can nest them as a structure. I hope, I hope I'm not delusional, but most people here who've had a conversation, for the most part, I can list all the points of our conversation. And then you'll notice we start talking about one of those points in our conversation, and then there's a bunch of points on that point in the conversation. And then maybe we'll branch off to a couple more points, and then we'll finish that conversation, and then I'll go back to the, the conversation before, the points about the point, and then once we're done, we'll go back to the main points. Stacking. Stacking. It's important that you begin to critically analyze and break down arguments so you can keep the main points clear so you can address them. So people's mind, you don't leave questions in people's minds. Oh, well, yeah, he or she addressed most of that, but what about this? They didn't really talk much about this. I don't know, right? You've got to be able to address it. Or if you can't address it because there's not enough time, you say, well, we can talk about this or we can talk about that. But those are two different conversations. And so you need to let it, you need to interject into the conversation enough that you don't let it go. At that point, people are just walking all over you. 
oh, I like communism. Well, don't you know about Stalin and Mao and how it never works and how everybody has to have the same things and blah, blah, blah. And if you let that go for 20 minutes, you just look like you were getting berated. And that, that doesn't look good to anyone. Um, so again, you need to keep in mind your debate. You also need to be aware of your objective. What are you doing in this debate? The two main things to keep in mind are the conditions of the audience. You're presumably already a revolutionary. You're not interested in making yourself interested in a revolution, hopefully. Now, I have, from time to time, I'm sure all of us go through fits of despair. But by and large, you're interested in your audience. So what you need to do, there are two ways that you can get the audience interested in revolution. You can either meet their conditions or you can change their conditions. And I would highly recommend you look up uh, the USJ Minuteman debate. It gives a great example, both myself and Will Van Wagenen, on everything you need to do in a debate. And it also gives a great example by the Minutemen on everything not to do in a debate. They are awful and make almost every single mistake. So if you find yourself doing anything that they do, you know you need to do the exact opposite. So, the conditions of the audience. Meet the objectives of the audience. Now, academically, right, what are they looking for? They're looking for evidence, they're looking for consistency. But that's not usually where you're going to be speaking. You're going to be speaking to your friends, to your family, uh, to your workplace. What are they looking for? What are important to your friends? Do they want a society that is more free? Do they want a society that's more just? Do they want a society in which they can smoke more weed and don't have to work? So many crappy jobs. These are all different conditions that your audience may have. And by and large, there's some reason they're listening to you. If they didn't walk away, there's something there interesting. And they want to know more. So you need to find out what it is. And I'm not saying pander to your audience, right? Um, probably most of you have seen me talk to people. I don't pander. I don't pretend that I'm not a communist or that communists are all American red-blooded people who want everything that you know they do and love America and you know an eagle flies behind me and an American flag is being waved. No. But what I do is I recognize what it is that they're interested in, right? And those are two very different things. If you want to see somebody absolutely fail on addressing what their audience wants but attempt to pander, look up Sam Webb of the CPUSA on Glenn Beck. It is one of the most embarrassing, degrading, humiliating aspects of a communist on anything. And I'm not saying anything necessarily about the CPUSA and not necessarily saying anything about Sam Webb, but that presentation was an abomination. He attempted to part, uh, pander to Glenn Beck and Tea Party conservatives, and he came across looking like an inconsistent liar that was pandering. And it was awful. Whereas, you can be principled, but still address what your audience is looking for. The other thing you can do is change the conditions of the audience. Through your very discussion or debate, change what it is that the audience thought they were there for, and make it into something else. Again, a good example of this would be the Minutemen debate. The Minutemen were all prepared, and everyone there was prepared and expecting a political debate about the laws, about the, you know, the bills, about the economics of immigrants, and you know, what they're doing to our economy, and what they're doing to, an Ameri or to America. And they expected us to be like, no, no, immigrants, you know, they're just people like you and me who want want to be part of America, right? And that's what the audience was expecting. Who cared most about America and making America strong? If you watch that debate, we do not care about making America strong. We don't talk about making America strong. What we talk about is the absolutely degrading, imperialist, deplorable behavior of the United States and the moral obligation it owes to all of the countries it's screwed over. And you'll, what you'll notice is the crowd went with it. And it wasn't just our people. 
In fact, one of the Minutemen, and Josh, Josh, were you there? Oh, well, well, I don't think this was on camera. One of the Minutemen at the end of the debate said, we, we can't be distracted by this young gentleman's very convincing rhetoric. We need to address the real issues. Were you there, Emily? Yeah. Right? If you say we can't be persuaded by this person speaking, that's a code way of saying we lost, and we lost so badly that the only thing I can ask for is a do-over. And we, we did not pander. We did not stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. We did not talk about how great America was and that people came here because they love America. No, we talked about people's home countries being devastated and destroyed and the Amer rich American elite acting as essentially slave owners and just abusing the hell out of immigrants. Now, besides talking about how great we did in the debate, the point is this. We changed the conditions of the audience. They came expecting a bland debate on what makes America strong, and we made it about what makes America wrong. And that is how you frame the debate. You change it. And as communists or anarchists or revolutionaries, we are the away team. Everything is set to support capitalism. Everyone you talk to is indoctrinated in capitalism, in racism, in sexism, in oppression. And so you, more often than not, will have to change the nature of the debate. They will want to talk about economic strength. They will want to talk about gross domestic product. And then you talk to Cuba, or talk about Cuba, you talk about infant mortality rate. You talk about life expectancy. You talk about education. You talk about cancer treatments. That's, again, another way of changing the conditions of the audience. And you need to be able to do that on the fly. Because you're always, again, you're always at the disadvantage. Now here's the thing. You're gonna, it, presumably, if you're so fired up about this lecture, you're gonna start going out and talking to everyone about revolution. And you're gonna try this, just what I suggested, exactly how I suggested it. And it's gonna fail miserably. And there's a reason why, again, you learn through experience. You learn through gauging what people think, how they act, how they're responding, how they're receiving things. And so the only way to learn is by practice, by doing. And you'll get better and better at making those transitions. You'll build up more and more information that you'll just be able to respond on. But you've got to keep doing it. You've got to keep trying. So those are the conditions of the audience. Another, good, another thing that's absolutely important to keep in mind, what are the conditions of the opponents? Now, again, what are they trying to do? The Minutemen, I'm using that because it's online and everyone can look at it. The Minutemen's objective was appeal to Americanism, to appeal to the strength of America, and what they really want is white Christian male. And that was their approach. By being conscious of their approach, and I'll deal with this a little later, you can better um, address it. Through various ways, we made it so their appeal to Americanism, or America, didn't look as a patriotic appeal. If we weren't conscious of their approach, it would have looked like they were the patriots and we were the evil, you know, terrible communists. Um, but by addressing their approach, and modifying our position to their approach and showing what Americanism looks like through murder in Iraq, Afghanistan, or, um, you know, in Latin America, suddenly, rather than their approach being a call to patriotism, it became a disgusting, reactionary, chauvinistic, nationalistic, xenophobic pomposity. Not because it wasn't, but it became clear to everyone exactly what it was. And you have to do that. You have to show and expose your opponent. So again, keep in mind the objectives of your opponent. The next thing you need to do is keep in mind the practical conditions regarding your opponent. If you're debating with your boss 
about communism, there's a certain line in which you're not like, yeah, well, you don't support it because your capital is paid. Not going to be helpful for you. Not going to make people look at you in a positive light. Um, if you're uh, debating um, somebody who is a person of color and you're white, probably want to stay away from ethnic slurs or ethnic examples or racial examples. If you're, if you're a man debating a woman, generally want to avoid, not to say you shouldn't be principled, certain sorts of aggressive behavior, certain sorts of sexually charged language. Same thing um, if somebody is um, a sexual or gender minority. Uh, nothing will put people off faster, not that you should be saying it anyway, but I've heard people say things when talking to me, oh, that's so gay. That is a good way for me to think that you're scum and want to have nothing to do with you. Now, of course, going back, I still deal with it because I'm trying to break them of those habits, but we have to be conscious. It's fine for the capitalists and the fascists and the supporters of domination and oppression to not really care who they're talking to or why they're talking to them or how they treat those people, but it's not good enough for us because again, we have every disadvantage. We are building a revolutionary movement out of scratch, and we cannot afford to make careless mistakes. We cannot afford to be unnecessarily rude to people we disagree with. We cannot afford to personally attack and degrade and dismiss people that we have to work with day in and day out, regardless of how strong our political disagreements are or even our personality disagreements, because that will not work. So you need to be conscious of your opponent, the person you're debating against. So how do you debate? There's three main approaches, um, the logos, the ethos, and the pathos, and you should use all of them. I would say, again, look at my Thinking Revolution lecture. That'll give you a really good detailed introduction to the logos. Logos is primary. This is going to be the evidence. Uh, this is going to be the argument. It has three things. The strength of the argument, the strength of the e evidence, and the strength of the links. The strength of the argument is how convincing your argument is. If you have a weird Byzantine argument that depends on, I don't know, 15th century Vienna, probably not going to convince anyone about the joys of communism. If you've got an argument about that depends on Aliens, uh, being socialists from the future, visiting this world, and yes, there are really people who believe that. Um, Trotskyists. Not all. Some Trotskyists. A small, small branch, yes. Um, you're not going to convince anyone. But if you give clear, common-sensible arguments, they're well-constructed, they're, uh, you know, they're well-supported, then you are going to convince people. So the strength of your arguments, the strength of your evidence. PhD Pete, who lives under the bridge, not a credible source for particle physics. Glenn Beck, not a credible source for political arguments. Some communist guy I know, not a credible source. To a certain extent, not even Karl Marx, Lenin, Goldman, Luxembourg, not credible sources. You need to build your arguments out of sources that have weight. So that's the second thing. And again, look at my other lecture. And then the strength of the links. How closely does the argument tie together? This is going to be very important if we're addressing an ethical subject. This is going to be the basis of our ethical reasoning that we want that subject to take up. This is going to be why. Revolution can solve the problems of millions of people starving a year. This is going to be why revolution can put a war or put an end to war and imperialism and oppression and sexism and racism. If you can't build an argument or your argument comes down to, well, revolution will solve it, you're not going to convince anyone. And you're degrading them and treating them like idiot children. Now, you don't have to be jargonistic. You don't have to use complex terminology. But don't feel like you can't make complicated arguments if they're consistent, 
if they're well put together. People are not idiots. They can follow reasoning. They can understand, if they've never heard it, that the Federal Reserve, how the Federal Reserve operates. You can explain how the Federal Reserve operates. You can explain how the Soviet Union operated. You can explain uh, why we should support anti-imperialism. Those are arguments that have a lot of different premises and a lot of different conclusions and a lot of different evidence. But if you really believe that you can reach people, people can understand that. And you can make arguments more complicated than war is bad, capitalism makes war, capitalism is bad. Right? So logos is going to be key. The next is going to be ethos, and that's something along the lines of character. So there are basically three different forms of ethos. There's your character of knowledge of wisdom, knowledge or wisdom. There is the character of goodness or virtue, and the character in relation to the audience. So part of the reason people listen to you is because you know what you're talking about. Um, which is not to say that you have to pretend to know what you're talking about. You can also establish good character by saying, if you don't know, I don't know about that particular thing, but I'm willing to research it. Or why don't we research it together? You establish, and that goes into the second one, your goodness, but if you establish, yes, I've read Marx. Yes, I've studied capitalism. Yes, I've read the Black Book of Communism. Yes, I know all about Glenn Beck and what he says. Yes, I know how the Federal Reserve works. People, that's going to lend credence to your argument because you will appear knowledgeable. And that matters. Um, it doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter completely, like, oh, I seem very smart, so I should listen to you. But also, you're not gonna reach people if you look like a dumbass and you don't know what you're talking about. If it's important enough to fight for revolution, again, you don't have to know everything, but then it's important enough to know enough about revolution to reach people, to tell them about the facts of Anarchist Spain, if you like Anarchist Spain. The Soviet Union, if you like the Soviet Union. Marx, Lenin, and Mao, if you like Marx, Lenin, and Mao. Or Trotsky, or Hocha, or you know, any list. If you're going to be pushing it, and you believe in it enough to fight for it, you should believe in it enough to know it. The next is goodness or virtue. Do you seem like somebody who actually has good intentions? If you don't know something, do you say, well, I don't know about that? Or do you look like you're just, do you look like you're there to try and help people understand what's going on in the world? Or do you look like you're there to score points and look smarter than everyone else? Well, if you look like that, no one's gonna like you. No one's gonna give anything, any credence to what you say because they don't think you have good intentions. Are you arguing for something that will help everyone or are you arguing for something that will help yourself? Generally speaking, people are not down with that. Um, and then also you need to look at your uh, character in relation to the audience. So again with the Minutemen, I didn't give fiery, passionate you know, denunciations of the Minutemen. I was sardonic. I was distant. I was cool. I was dismissive. And that lent me a character that I knew what I was talking about and that they were jokes. The bombastic way they uh, carried themselves made them lose all ethos with the audience. So again, it's not a set formula. How you talk to any given audience is going to be different depending on the audience. You'll give a different speech when you're giving a speech at a rally than when you're talking to your coworkers or your family or whatever. Pretty straightforward. And how you come across is going to be different. What counts as good character will be different in those situations. Finally, again, pathos. This would be the feelings of the audience. This would be applying, uh, appealing to their feelings, but also using their feelings, right? Um, and not using it in a pejorative sense, but if you're in a situation where what matters is who's right, then appealing to a calm, disinterested feeling is going to play better with the audience than being wild and hysterical. Whereas sometimes if you're at a rally and everyone's pumped up, sometimes being wild and hysterical is the best way to appeal to the audience's feelings. Um, so again, you need to be careful about your delivery. You need to be careful about how you're presenting yourself and what emotions that you yourself are presenting. So that's sort of the pathos is the emotion. But again, more complex than that. It encompasses all sorts of feelings. Feelings of pride, feelings of success, 
Sometimes feelings of failure. Some of the most important speeches have been speeches given at a time of failure to raise spirits, to create perseverance, to soldier on. The final thing you need to keep in mind when engaged in debate is the other speaker. Keep a notepad with you until you can do it in your head. I hope, again, I'm not sounding self-aggrandizing, but I, for the most part, can list everybody's points, or at least the main points that they make when I'm talking to them or debating. Why? Because it's important. So note every point being made by the person you're speaking with. Address every point being made. Now, this is going to sound weird, but you need to affirm points that you agree with. If they say something you agree with, say, and I agree with this as long as it means this. Because one thing that happens is you hear something you agree with, you leave it because, oh, I agree with that. And then they go back and distort what it is that you, what, they distort that point to mean what it is that they want. The Minutemen did this when they asked me, well, you know, illegal, or, uh, wouldn't you say that immigrants who are illegal? And I said, well, not necessarily. What do you mean by illegal? And they mean, you know, they broke the law. It's like, well, what do you mean by law? And they're like, the law established by the democratic United States of America. And, and so, Right? What they're trying to do is get me on a point. Now, of course, I agree that, yeah, they're breaking the law that Congress passed. But the way I answer is, to whatever extent you think the United States is democratic, yeah, sure. Right? Because I agree with the point, but then qualify it in a way in which they can't use it later to say I'm anti-democratic. Right? I point out that the United States isn't very democratic, or I imply it. So they can't go back. So again, address every single point, even points you agree with. And finally, you need to understand the nature of their appeal. This is very similar to going back to what it is that they're trying to do. Are they appealing through logos? Are they appealing through ethos? Are they appealing through pathos? What is it they're trying to do? What aspect, what approach are they doing? And then address it and change it or combat it or deal with it. And again, there is no set formula. These are just basic guidelines and basic structures. Approach every conversation, every debate, every public speech as something new, as something that you are addressing for the first time. And it's only through that way that we can avoid becoming dogmatic and thinking mechanically and just becoming people who speak revolution by essentially saying, because I said so, or just trust me because I know. So, really long. Thank you all for staying here, and hopefully it was of some value. Um, are there any questions, comments, objections, scathing denunciations? Yes. Uh, so like, online, in like a forum situation, it's kind of hard, I mean, because you know, right, there, the audience can be however many people, and often I'm not just talking to like the person who like made a comment originally. I'm like discussing like all of these points all of these people made. Um, what have you found to be useful in uh, working in that sort of situation? The most useful way to have a debate online is to not have a debate online. That is by far the most useful way. Now again, context matters. Um, here's sort of the thing. If someone is posting a good point, um, usually then I try to address that point in a substantive way. Uh, I use the two, usually I use the two strike rule. You, 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 I'm guessing you're talking mostly about Facebook. No, or I mean any sort of like online media. atmosphere. Yeah. So people are discussing. So what what happens is you get two asshole comments. You get one, and I address it in a reasonable, rational way, treating it like it's a serious comment instead of them being an asshole and just, you know, trying to score points. And then you get a second one, which will be your response. And if they take the response seriously, then I treat their conversation as seriously and go from there. Um, but if they give another, if they give another asshole comment, I address it like, again, a substantive comment addressing any points that might be there. 
or pointing out, well, as a matter of fact, you didn't address any of the original things in my comment. You didn't address this point, that point, or that point. And so they care. Of course, they don't at that point. And then they put a third asshole comment, and this is just for me. I'm not necessarily recommending this. Probably, in abstractly, as I think about it, you should probably never respond in kind. But after the third time, um, I'm just like, you're an asshole. And I have all multifarious different ways of saying you're an asshole, and it's all contextual, and i usually salient. Uh, but that's what I do, is I try and give them two approaches. And again, this is also where the context of your opponent matters. Is this some asshole from high school that you never heard of, you never talk of? Is it just some, somebody who you don't give a shit about? Like, I'll be honest. Uh, if you go to the RSU YouTube channel, there are a bunch of stupid comments about me, like this bastard uh, from the UK who's like, oh, middle class Stalinist. Well, first off, I'm lower class. Second off, I'm brown. So there's a lot of reasons that what he said is kind of, kind of racist, actually. But it's not worth me addressing it, because I don't give a shit about this person. I don't care. Sometimes it happens on my Facebook. Actually, more recently is people pa pass or post asshole things on my Facebook. I don't care. Because most of them, I don't give a shit about them. They don't do anything for me. And I don't mean like for me personally. Like they're never gonna help out with anything. They're never gonna, you know, um, give a lecture. They're never gonna have plan anything. They're never gonna pay for anything. So whatever, I don't even give a shit about them. Sometimes I'm in a bad mood and I enjoy ripping into people. So I'll use that as a little bit of sport. But then some people I constantly have problems with. I constantly have arguments with. I constantly think they're being assholes, but I work really closely with them. And so I can't just be like, you're a fucking asshole, and I hate you, and I don't want you posting on my, bo uh, my board anymore. Um, because I, again, I work with them so much. And in fact, sometimes the best way for me to deal with those people is not to say anything to them at all and remove them because I have to see them all the time. So again, context really matters on that, in, on that case. But does that? Yeah, I'm, I'm also specifically like on Casimo Project, half the time I'm like, this could be really interesting. And then it turns into this huge shit show where everyone's like being ridiculous. And it's like, as peers though, as people who really could use certain topics as like, you know, to break through to some serious organizing stuff or whatever it may be. Um, it just turns into a shit show and it's like, man, it's just such a turn off. I'm like, how, I guess none of these people really know how to discuss with one another because it's like based on semantics half the time. So, at the risk of offending people, I'm going to talk a little bit about Cosmo Project here. And here's the thing. This is what I'd recommend to you. If there's ever a good discussion on Cosmo Project, they'll take it out of the comments and they'll post it as a main page. I would just wait for shit to get posted as a main page. Um, a lot of great stuff on Cosmo Project. It's one of the few websites I check every day or every couple days because uh, they have a lot of interesting shit there. I don't read the comments. Occasionally, and it, I swear to God, it's not out of narcissistic uh, intention. Sometimes I read the comments on my post and try to address them because these people have taken the time to read my article right. and post. But a lot of times it's fucking awful. And there's nothing to say to them. Not all of them, not everyone. There are a lot of really great posters on Cosima, but there's like, this guy's wrong because he likes Mao. I'm sure you've seen stuff yeah. like this. Or like, he's not following Marx close enough. There's nothing to say to them. You're not dealing in person-to-person -person basis. To be perfectly blunt, not, I'm not naming any names. I don't have any names to name, because again, I don't fixate on this and focus on this. I found the biggest assholes online are the people who don't, not a, not a universal rule, but don't have to work with anyone. Because they're not part of anything. They're not doing anything. So take it with a grain of salt, 
out of any given 20 posts, not just on Cosma, but on any... Oh yeah, any anything, but that one especially, because sometimes I'm like, wow, this is a really great conversation, and then all of a sudden I'm like... Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would say this, and this I had no qualms. Get on RevLeft sometime. Uh, RevLeft is a leftist forum. See the kind of the quality of conversations there. Look back at Cosmo Project and rejoice. So, again, it's about context. Um, just for that sort of situation, I'd only address people that you actually think are making valuable contributions and just ignore the rest. But I don't know, maybe somebody has some better thing uh, about fighting with people online. I, I don't know. Or like being a blogger and having people maybe ask questions and it's like, okay, well, are you really interested in me answering this or am I going to answer it? I mean, I don't know. It's just. Yeah, the loaded question. Yeah, I mean. Like, how, why are you comfortable with now killing the dinosaurs? Right. You know? it's, it's judgment call. And I, that's, again, I want to stress that at the end. Stress it, stress it, stress it. There is no law. There's nothing I can give you that you could just follow, and it will tell you every instance or every situation. Everything's unique. Everything needs to be approached every time with fresh eyes and a new approach. And has, however sat unsatisfying that may be, when you are not talking to someone individually, it's very hard to engage in any sort of analysis of them. And so that's usually out the window. And then again, if we're talking about rhetoric, um, if there's a conversation worth having online, then have it usually as best you can. Try to maintain the high ground. But if they're just being assholes, try and ignore them. Unless, again, if you're feeling a particularly bad mood that day and you need some release, then uh, go to town. Yeah? Who is in the audience in the U.S. Canadian Minute meant to be? Well, that's the thing is there was a mixed audience. There was USJ people, there was Minutemen people, and then there were the people who were just kind of there because it was at the library. So my, my goal then was to garner support for the USJ people, to make them feel enthusiastic about what they're doing, to win over the people in the middle, and to isolate the Minutemen and make them look fucking awful so that their own supporters in the audience felt embarrassed to support them. One great thing is when you're debating against someone, what you want to have everybody in the audience who is a diehard say. Now, it'd be great in an imaginary world if these diehard people would be like, oh, yeah, you know what? Those are some salient points. I don't necessarily support the Minutemen anymore. The best thing you can really hope for is be like, man, I wish I was up there debating because I would have done such a much better job. That's a good way of knowing that they were humiliated. And they were. So, Again, there's multiple audiences. Again, try not to approach it in a dogmatic fashion that, oh, there's one audience, and if I just find this secret part of the audience, then I'll have the up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, BA, select, start, code to defeat them. Yeah, I went there. Konami code. Live it, love it. Um, and so you just got to be very cognizant. It's, it's, you've got to have a, a really deep sensitivity to where you are and who you're talking to. And it's difficult, and you just got to keep talking to people all the time. Cultivate that skill, just like handball or speaking French. Maybe not just speaking French, but yeah. Any other final thoughts, questions? All right, well, thank you very much for coming, and uh,